certainly not a business to me, you know. Music is 100% emotion and, and a soul thing because anybody who sits down with a business head to try and make a track is not going to have a long career. You have to be in this for the music. My name is Victor Kidson and we're here in Zurich, uh, Switzerland for uh, the Synergy event. I got John O'Callaghan with me right here. How do you feel? Great. How are you, Victor? I'm good. I'm happy to, uh, to finally meet you. And yourself. Haven't seen you, but I've uh, heard about you for a few years. I'm happy to hear that. And I've, I've obviously heard about you as well. I've been um, a big personal fan of your music, so I'm happy that we get a time to, uh, to do this as well. Well, great. Thank you very much. How does it feel to, uh, to be playing Zurich? It's nice, yeah. It's um, a lovely city. I've only I uh, played in Switzerland twice, uh, so uh, tonight is the, the first club gig in a, in a while, so I'm really looking forward to it. The last time was a festival, which is a kind of different experience, so it seems uh, with the social media and promotion and everything tonight, it's going to be a really good night. It is. I've been with the promoter a couple of times before, and uh, hopefully it's going to be a blast tonight. <clears throat> um, how do, what do you think traveling has given you as a person, like traveling as much as you do? Um, a lot of jet lag. <laughs> um, I don't know. Maybe that's a tough question. Uh, you get to see a lot of the world. Um, I don't know. You kind of maybe get a little bit wiser. You, you get to appreciate what you have at home, and you get to see what you know poverty is in some parts of the world, and how lucky most Europeans are. And um, it's a privileged job to have, and you know, to make music and play it to people is really, I mean, a dream job. So. I appreciate every year that I do it and uh, do my best every time. And uh, traveling is, is uh, something that I, I do enjoy, uh, you know. But it does have its downsides too because it takes a lot of energy away uh, from uh, studio things because I do everything myself, and um, I have to, uh, you know, be in a tip-top shape to get in studio. And sometimes when you come back from uh, a really long weekend far away, me personally, I'm kind of wiped out for at least a day, two days. So from that point of view, it's, it does affect uh, productivity, but it's, uh, it's part of the job. What does, uh, what does life look like at home? Um, well, it's changed over the years, to be honest. Uh, family has taken a, a more important role uh, the last few years. And um, I don't always produce straight away when I come home. I usually give my ears a couple of days break. Um, and then uh, I, I would usually be always working on a couple of tracks at a time and uh, decide when to finish them depending on the release schedule. I don't just finish tracks and leave them sitting there. I would like, you know, leave them at 70% and then go back to it might six months later. I find that's a better, uh, you know, you, give it, you get a better overview of the track at a, uh, rather than like just pushing it out in two days. And uh, then you can play it and test it too. That's the good thing about DJing every week. If it doesn't sound great, you can go back and fix it, which happens, uh, which can happen, you know. Um, I, uh, I uh, spend a lot of time with my son during the week as much as I can. And then uh, pretty much uh, just keeping everything going, administration, shopping, laundry, and then Friday I'm back in the airport. So it's, uh, you know, depending on the, the travel location, I can get a lot more done. Like, say, for example... I'll be home tomorrow at uh, 12 o'clock back home, so I've got the whole week to uh, do some work. So uh, that, that's a, it's a, an advantage when you're not traveling so far all the time. I hear that uh, musically January is a big month for you, right? Yeah, it historically has been over the last few years because I, I usually take most of January off um, because um, all the traveling year-round, uh, it's the only real quiet month of the year. After New Year's Eve, everybody's kind of chilling anyway. So uh, I have made albums and stuff and remixes and pushed, uh, you know, I, I can get in the studio for three to four weeks in January and get really creative because I don't have the luxury to do that all year round. You know, sometimes I would really love two months off and maybe just go somewhere on my own and uh, make music because um, all the traveling and stuff definitely does affect your, well, mine anyway. And, uh, and you know, you see rock bands and and they go away for maybe six months to make an album i have a little kind of a dream about doing something like that sometime so 
maybe in the next few years I can approach it like that. If we go back uh, a couple of years when you were 15, 16, uh, you went to Spain on a holiday. What did you bring back from that holiday? Where are you getting this information from? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, teenage years have a lot of memories of dance music in different forms. I wasn't even really aware that I was getting into dance music because back then dance music was just in the charts and it wasn't called dance music. You know, like really old pop songs like Eiffel 65 Blue and, you know, they got into my head and I didn't even know what it was, but I just liked it. And, you know, Ann Lee two times, like cheesy uh, pop stuff. And then I, from there, got into the Chemical Brothers Faithless, like the big live acts. And then from there, you discover DJs like Mauro Picado, Paul Van Dyke. So I, I started off with the uh, ultimate kind of uh, pop access, like everybody did in your summer holidays in Spain. That's what a lot of Irish people go on holidays. And, uh, went to some nightclub every night with my cousin and they were playing DJ Jean the Launch and Kamizra Let Me Show You, tracks like that and um, I came back from there with a, a definite uh, bigger interest in it and started to get the tracks and record them off the radio back when tape decks were still around and then after that I got into technology and when, when you get into technology then I started to see that it's possible to maybe make some of this myself so that was the early roots there's a quote from you that when you said that for four years you did amateur productions, but then the fifth year, yeah, what happened the fifth year? Like when you became more professional. And I'm not saying that you did amateur, but you said that uh, before I heard it somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 making music as a you know a, a new producer is you start off as a hobby. You think what you're making is great, but you know actually it's not until probably year three, four, or five. And I started when I was 17, probably. 16, 17, and it wasn't until I was 21, 22 before I fully had the science of it down and, you know, I could analyse how tracks were made and apply that to my own. I used to, like, break down tracks, like, written form and draw them all out in the sections. Going on the bus to school used to take, like, an hour and a half every day, so I had an A4 pad and I would listen to tracks and have the whole, like, a blueprint of tracks. So I used to take those blueprints and then say, right, I'm going to make my track with different elements but in that blueprint that's that's how I started to understand the structure of it and um, Paul uh, Denton probably will tell you the same thing you know you, it does take two or three years of learning your your craft before you can say you're making quality trance music and that's the advice I give to any young producers that are sending me tracks now like just keep doing what you're doing you know it, it might take you 12 more tracks to get there but do do every track and you will get there how did how did music change for you when you went into music full time? It didn't really change because I still love everything that I used to love. I can appreciate a good track as as much as I ever did. It's certainly not a business to me, you know. Music is one hundred percent emotion and and a soul thing because anybody who sits down with a business head to try and make a track is not going to have a long career. You have to be in this for the music. And uh, you can see over the years people who just jumped ship to every genre that was popular and like they're all gone now. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite proud of the fact that I stuck to what I love and it's, it's come back round again. And all the people who I know, like some people have had like four or five different genres in the last 10 years. And I think the fans can see through that. So, yeah, I'm happy to uh, be where I am. I was going to go into that as well. How... Because you haven't progressed a lot, but you've still kept, and you still experienced, um, ex experimented with stuff as well, but you still kept the John O'Callaghan feel. Yeah. Has that been hard or has it just been natural? No, to be honest, totally natural. I always end up, uh, I try to make a track a certain style and somehow it ends up sounding like me at the end. It, it, it's just all habits, production habits, I suppose. Like a painter painting a painting, you know it's that painter somehow or another, you know. Yeah. Like, all of a sudden, they're not just going to start painting different paintings. Somehow it's theirs. But essentially, uh, you know, through different genres, I've always tried to experiment and open my own production mind and horizons to uh, different styles. And uh, now I'm all about learning uh, the more technology and, and attempting different um, styles of tracks because, I mean, uh, really, I, I, can't, I can't make trance all week long if I want, but it doesn't do enough for me uh, creatively. I need to try other things, otherwise I feel like I'm just uh, flogging a dead horse, you know. 
<laughs> Tell me about uh, Henrik Suberstein. Yeah, that's a progressive alias of mine. Um, over the last three years, I got really into uh, DJs like Guy J, um, Hernan Catania, Nick Warren. And uh, listening to their music when I'm traveling and driving actually gives me great ideas for trance because when, when all you listen to is trance, you, you run the risk of making trance that just sounds like every other track. And um, Henrik Zuberstein was just a funny name I came up with. Myself and my friend, we, we, we met a, a, a lawyer at a gig in New York and he gave us his business card and his name was something something Silverstein or something and I said I'd put a Henrik at the start of it a kind of a Swedish Swedish American Jewish lawyer <laughs> so uh, that's where the name came from but the name is a name you know I, I didn't want to have everything under John O'Callaghan because then it gets a little bit uh, blurry people aren't sure what you're going to play and you know fans start saying I hope you're not going to play progressive and stuff so that's why I keep them separate and um, and focus on each each name for each different style and it's worked out well you know it's worked out well. Could you ever dream about DJing under another alias for a progressive or something like that? Um, well, not specifically, you know, just under that name. Like last week in Dublin, we done the, the Total Spectrum uh, show, which was four hours of all my own music, starting as Henrik Zuberstein, then uh, mixing into Joint Operations Center, and then the John O'Callaghan tracks at the end, which worked really well and really enjoyed. It's the first time I've done anything like that. I mean, I started at 120 BPM. And the place was rocking after half an hour, so it was, I had a little personal smile on my face to see that progressive can uh, upend the place just as much as techno and trance. So um, that's the plan there to uh, maybe do a few more Total Spectrum sets and uh, expand my discography a bit more as the years go on and continue experimenting and enjoying dance music. If we travel back in time again, um, you played, I think it was one of your first gigs, at a local town hall where you were from when your school had finished all their exams. Yeah. What kind of musical dreams did you have back then? None whatsoever. It was just purely a, a bit of a laugh. Um, we stuck posters up around the school and uh, it was at the end of exams or something and there was nothing on. So we said we'd try and put something on. But at that point, I wouldn't have... Even, you know, my friends wouldn't have even considered me a DJ to be like, what the hell is this guy doing? <laughs> so we just put it on for a bit of fun and um, people showed up and that maybe I think that's where I got the, the bug that night. And um, uh, ever since I've uh, been doing it and uh, friends of mine from over the years who I haven't seen always find it a little bit funny when they when they find out the, the career that I ended up in because I'm, I would say 9 out of 10 people would have predicted that I would not do this. So, What would they predict that you would be doing? Probably like computers in an office job, like, you know, kind of nerdy stuff. <laughs> Something normal, yeah. You have a really big music focus right now. How does that affect you? Um, in a positive way because um, I, I can uh, firmly see that uh, the only uh, way to to be successful or expand your your mind as a producer or you know as a musician you know career aside all that business stuff you have to care about the music itself and the development of it and the new people coming into the scene and nurturing that because uh these days it can become a little bit business you know there's social media there's just 10 different networks you have to do every day and oh what if you don't put a post up on your radio show and this that and the other you can get swamped in all the uh all those little things that can take away from, uh, you know, that first time when you were 18, 19 and you sat down and you turn your computer on and you're like, oh my God, I've got all these programs. I'm going to like make 20 tracks as fast as I can. Like that kind of energy that, that you have uh, when, when you're like in any job, uh, you know, you, you have to always remember to, to uh, hold on to that. And, uh, you know, it's a very privileged uh, job to have and having that opportunity to go and make that music is what I'm uh, enjoying again lately because um, all the traveling and you know you do some big shows you can get nervous you're looking at your diary I'm going here and there it's it's important to uh, take a little bit of time and say hang on a minute what made me love this at the start and and uh, always give yourself some time for that and uh, I just find that uh, artists these not uh, not artists these days. Some artists can be a little bit more of a product rather than a musician. So I'm uh, doing my best to to be a musician and an artist rather than a 
somebody who just wants to get booked. You know, we all know a few of them. In general, do you think that um, the trans industry or the trans scene right now could do better with a, a bigger music focus? Um, trans? No, I wouldn't say that. Uh, trans is doing fantastic. And, uh, you know, you listen to any of the uh, upcoming trans producers, it's, it's as pure as it's ever been. You know, there's no real cheese in it. There's no guys trying to be cheesy to, to get more plays. People are making absolutely pure trance as solar stone would say but you know it's uh it's it's definitely uh, very positive like some of the demos i get from guys i may not have heard of are all like wow some really cool new guys out there in a, in a time where you know most young people are probably getting into edm or whatever other stuff so uh i, I firmly believe that trance is uh, thriving and always kind of has been this has been a conversation for years oh it's trance this trance that trance has always been you know, very solid for those who are dedicated to trance. And, you know, it's the people that are going to come weaving in and out of it and going left and right and, you know, maybe I'll, I'll uh, not play trance for a while and then come back to trance. I mean, I, I don't know, like, I can't really say too much about that. Everybody's different, but uh, I think trance lately, I mean, producers tonight like, like Paul Dent and Cold Rush, you know, you, uh, I wouldn't have known the guys three years ago. And now they're making tracks that, in my opinion, are at like a really high level. So uh, that's, that's very positive to see. And I can imagine next year there's probably going to be at least another batch of 10 more guys doing the same. Festivals like uh, Luminosity and stuff highlight that, showing all the new guys and, and the success and, and the amount of people at it shows that you don't need uh, A-listers to, to have a good trance event. And that's what I love about trance. We're not relying on, on a, you know, we're, we're, it's more of a team effort. You're um you're one of the most iconic remixers within the scene. I don't know if you agree, but that's what I think. How do you approach a remix? What happens in your head when you get a track that you're supposed to remix or about to remix? Um, a remix for me is very enjoyable because it's I, I kind of find it a little bit like a puzzle. And when you get the remix pack and you have the parts, and then I can start thinking to myself, this is going to go here, this is going to go there. I can chop that up, take a little bit of that. And it's way less pressure than an original because it's a fun approach and you're putting your stamp on somebody else's track. Maybe they want to have a harder club thing for whatever reason. They might want a remix from me. And over the years, it, it, I have done some remixes that I you know, have completely turned around with new melodies and new parts. And I take a little bit of pride in that as well because years ago when I was um, uh, getting into uh, production, Producers like Ricky F and Mara Picado used to make remixes that were nothing like the original, but were a better track. Mm. So that's what I, um, you know, if if I don't feel the original is genuinely something I will play, I'm gonna do my utmost to make sure I am playing it and all the other trance guys are playing it because there's no point in wasting a remix. And uh, I've done a lot of them over the years, uh, but one I recently did for the John Double O Fleming track. I mean, I put. 70% of all those sounds in myself and uh, I could have saved it as an original but it's a remix and that's kind of cool, it's a creative process and I'll move on to the next one If we talk about uh, creative processes your, your first vocal track Big Sky took 6 months to produce, what was that process like? Um, a lot of back and forth <laughs> in the post with CDRs to uh, Audrey Gallagher because um, in the post, like you mean, you yeah. sent it. We, the broadband wasn't around then, I don't think so. so. You had to burn CDs and yeah. send her. Yeah, burn CDs and uh, and and send her audio, and she would send me audio back and vice versa. And at at that time, I I was uh, very aware of what a, a good vocal track was, and I had in my head what I wanted mine to be, and I wasn't going to kind of just push one out. I wanted it to be special, and to get to work with Audrey Gallagher for. You know, first time round was unbelievable. Uh, Agnelli and Nelson pretty much set that up for me, and uh, they done the remix as well. Like, so I have a big thanks to the guys for that. But working with Audrey was just, you know, more or less the first version of the vocals were what the final version is, and uh, I spent all that time on the original mix. You know, the original is quite a lot of sounds in it, and there's loads of atmospheric stuff and little intricate things that that I spent ages making and back then my computer may not have been as fast as it was now so that could have extended the production process but 
Yeah, some tracks can take four days, some tracks can take six months, and collaborations generally uh, generally take longer because you're dealing with another person. And back then it was postage system, you know, open up a CDR, put it in your computer, listen to a WAV, bring it into yours, send it back. But everything's different now with Dropbox and Skype and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, Big Sky original mix took six months. Here's a question that I think a lot of people w would like to know the answer to, me as well, but... How do you start on an original track? Where do you start? Every single one is different because, um, you know, you might you might say, it, well, my the way I think about it is, is like if I'm making, I look at my DJ sets and I look at the tracks that are really working. And, you know, sometimes you might want to say to yourself, I'm going to make a track that's going to like smash at every set. And these are the elements it needs. And then, you know, if you need a melody, you can sit down, have a week of making melodies and try five in a minute. Or if, uh, you know, there's a portion of my set that has, uh, I, I need a kind of a techno joint operation center thing, I'd work on beats. And the uh, vocals are completely different because, uh, you know, I, I'm not a big fan anymore of making a track and then asking a girl to sing on it. I, I'm not sure if that's the most creative way of doing it. I would much prefer to do it in the studio live but you d that doesn't happen either with the international travel you know you can't always have that luxury but uh, you know my track say for example one special particle i had the melody on my computer for like nine months and uh, i had the file name saved and then i have a big poster on my wall and i write one special particle on it and every day i come in and i look at it and until i make it it doesn't get a line through it you know so i have a hit list of stuff of different projects just to make sure i don't forget because I do have quite a lot of demos that are unfinished and you you know you could come back to it two years later and say oh yeah I think I'm going to finish that now and uh, production to me you know people approach things maybe like an album where they have to make 12 tracks and it's pressure and deadlines and oh I need to have this out but I, I make it as it comes to my mind and having subculture as my own label means that I can put something out four weeks after I make it so that's a massive luxury because tracks don't get old you don't have to say oh well, i need to send it to them now so they can release it in december and by the time december comes around you're sick of it yeah. you know which used to pretty much be the way it was up until recently and um you know having that luxury of uh, uh your own label and working with other producers as well and and collabing there's so many options now i mean it's consider compared to how uh I was at the start like it was a big unknown kind of a thing that I wanted to learn I, I do have you know decent confidence now that I could make pretty much m most dance music if I sat down and listened long enough I can analyze most sounds and, and hear what it needs to be with the software that I have I've learned it pretty well you know it might not be the most complex stuff in the world to uh, you know uh, you know the Pro Tools guys and all this kind of stuff but I, I know how to get the sounds out of what I have and uh, that's really enjoyable to sit down and say, right, what am I going to make today? You know, that's that's enjoyable. Going back to uh, to the John O'Callaghan hit list, what does it look like right now in your studio? Um, well, I have one new vocal track with an, uh, an Irish uh, vocalist and that nobody knows. That's really good. I have the breakdown done and the vocal is in there and I'm just uh, waiting for the right time to uh, pad out the rest of it and... and you know, let it uh, sit there for a couple of weeks, go back to it, make the improvements. I have also, I have uh, one big instrumental track that's almost finished, a kind of a uplifting classic trancer. Um, I have one kind of a side trance vocal album track that doesn't really have any climax, but just goes along like a song rather than a club. They, 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 you know, it's just a song but it has a side bass line and the girl singing in it. It's a very nice combination. There's piano in it too and like a little bit of guitar and stuff, but um, that's pretty much finished and I'm just waiting, waiting to perfect it, you know, and, and uh, then January is coming up, so the hit list will expand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you said, uh, you said album track now. But that's how I would describe a track that's not a peak time club track. Oh, right. A track that is just a, a song for itself rather than, oh, where's the drop, where's the climax, where's the build? You know, some some tracks are nice that just tip along. Would be an Irish saying, you know, it just chugs along and does its thing. It doesn't need to blow your head off. It's just an enjoyable track.
So there's no album in uh, in the ideas? Potentially, no. I, I don't uh, lock myself into something like that because then you get people like you asking me when's it coming out. <laughs> <laughs> so I just do it in a, in a no-pressure way and when I have enough tracks to consider, you know, maybe uh, going forward with an album. But, you know, an album's a big task. I've had three albums uh, to my name so far and I'm, I'm very proud of all of them. And when I feel like uh, another album is required, I will start that process. But at the moment, I'm enjoying the label and the events and, and being creative with the different genres, you know. And um, an album really should be a special thing in terms of the time you put into it. And right now, with all the touring I'm doing, uh, it would probably take me two years to get it done because I'm a little bit of a perfectionist in terms of I do everything myself. I don't. I have no interest in, like half writing tracks and you know shortcuts it's all me from the start to the end so it does take quite a while I was looking through your uh, discography prior to this interview I don't know how many of my favorite tracks within the trancing that I could find or that I could see that you've done but I mean for example where does Find Yourself come from? How did that track come about? Um, well Find Yourself uh, was I had I was working on uh, what I wanted, I was going through a phase of listening to a lot of Gabriel and Dresden and uh, I always loved the way that they brought real instruments into dance in a cool way you know, like uh, Mind Circus and 90% of their of their album tracks are all very musical and I used to be really inspired by what they'd done vocally so I, I made this uh, backing track with a, a guitar sample in it and some chords and uh, sent it to um, Sarah Howells, who I'm not sure how I got in touch with her, or maybe she got in touch with me, I can't remember. And uh, then she said, uh, she sent back, she said, actually, I have this like one minute guitar track, if you want to hear it, maybe we can work that into it. And it was like a really low quality MP3. And I listened to it one time and I was like, oh my God, winner. <laughs> so uh, we, we, um, amalgamated her chords and my chords and, and made it into a, a little bit more dance friendly structure and uh, put the uplifting kind of uh, saw pads and stuff in it and that's Find Yourself originally was a kind of a my effort at Gabriel and Dresden you know and uh, then Car Cosmic Gate remixed it who I always wanted to remix from and um, it took me about five goes before I got one so uh, I was very happy to get that and uh, after that, the track just took off, and Armin was playing the Cosmic Gate remix, and other people were playing the original mix, so it was kind of ticking two boxes at once, so that's the story of Find Yourself. And then the fantastic Heat Beat uh, remix. Yeah, Heat Beat uh, done a kind of a really cool club mix, I, I, which I asked them to do, uh, good friends of mine from Argentina, and uh, they done really powerful trance remix, which I, I can play as well, like, so it's great, you have three options of one track, but uh, I must say... Uh, you know, the genius of that track has to be given to Sarah Howells because um, she wrote the lyrics and she had that hook. So uh, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> uh, we only have uh, a couple of months left uh, until Christmas. How are you going to spend the holidays? Um, I'll be at home for 90% of it with uh, my son enjoying some uh, Super Mario Kart and uh, Jurassic World, all that kind of stuff, Lego. And uh, then the 20 night of the 26th, 27th, I'll be working. Um, we have a subculture show in Dublin at Christmas. And uh, then New Year's Eve, uh, I'm not sure where that is at the moment. So um, I, I really love Christmas. Christmas is a big thing in Ireland. And it's always cold and, you know, you want to stay in. You don't want to go to the airport. So um, I'm very much looking forward to it. My son has his Christmas list ready. So that's all I'm worried about.